starts right now. San Antonio saw hail in some parts, rain in others, but we're still dealing with dry conditions. And a controversial border plan is playing out. A bus of migrants left our viewing area just yesterday, plus more pushback on the governor's plan. Plus, two children escape the war in Ukraine and make it to San Antonio. When we started, I told, hey, jump and we will bring you here. What their uncle is now planning for that family. But first. Tonight, we start with breaking news. Two bodies discovered under a bridge and police are trying to figure out how they died. It all happened on the city's northwest side on Evers Road, just north of Loop 410. Someone told police they came across the bodies of a man and a woman in their 30s or 40s. Police say it appears they might have been living under that bridge. The medical examiner will try to determine an exact cause of death. Political stun or not, it is happening. The busing of migrants from the Texas border to Washington, D.C. has begun. One bus left from Del Rio just last night. Meanwhile, the Texas Military Department is carrying out mass migrant response rehearsals. As the night team's Lee Waldman reports, all of this is a response from Governor Greg Abbott just ahead of the end of Title 42. Since Thursday, border cities like Del Rio, Eagle Pass, Laredo, and Zapata have played host to thousands of soldiers with the Texas Military Department conducting mass migrant response rehearsals. Essentially just uh, trying to ensure that, uh, practice ensuring that uh, you know, we are able to respond at a port of entry to a mass migration event. The move comes after Governor Greg Abbott announced aggressive actions ahead of the CDC's decision to lift Title 42 next month. The order blocks asylum claims and expels migrants due to the COVID-19 public health emergency. The exercises are, are tied to that in that uh, we do not you know, want to be caught flat-footed uh, in the event that uh, something does occur. Right now, around 6,500 military personnel are working along the border, 350 miles from Harlingen to Del Rio. That's everything from security to uh, barrier construction to sustainment and also just command and control. Meanwhile, in cities like Del Rio, the busing of migrants to Washington, D.C., who have been processed and released has already begun. Out of the 261 that were released, 24 did get on a bus. Migrants have a choice about whether to go on the bus. The process of signing up each person to go is being handled by the Texas Department of Emergency Management. TDEM's involvement was a key factor in Valverde County Commissioners signing off. The buses are a good idea if we're not the ones helping hold their hand to get them on the bus. The commissioners are concerned about potential lawsuits from migrants who make it to Washington but don't want to be there. There's also lingering fear the, quote, free ride will draw more people. It does scare me, though, that now if you have people wanting to go that way, now they know that you can come to Del Rio and we're going to get you on the bus. Uh, so it's sort of good and bad. One commissioner asked if there is a way to incentivize everyone, everyone to get on the bus. At this point, the answer is no. Those buses are being paid for with taxpayer dollars designated by the state legislature for border security. The mass migrant response rehearsals are going to continue weekly for now with a larger exercise planned closer to the ending of Title 42 next month. Reporting live, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Lee, thank you. Now, Governor Greg Abbott's plan includes enhanced truck inspections at the border. Some people are protesting that, and it's led to a backup in the Rio Grande Valley. And look at this picture that we're about to show you right there. You see all those trucks. You can see just how delayed the traffic is for all those trucks on the Mexican side of the far Reynosa International Bridge. Just yesterday, truckers blocked that crossing. So people are actually traveling about 30 miles away from that area to get across. Agriculture Commissioner Sid Miller is concerned that this is going to cost truckers carrying produce, which will eventually lead to higher prices for all of us. Miller says that the state should shift its efforts to fight the end of Title 42. Now, our border coverage is going to continue tomorrow. Alicia Barrera is going to be at the Rio Grande Valley with live reports. So tune in to KSAT 12 or watch us on our streaming app, KSAT Plus.
Wildfires becoming more common in our area, so much so that a disaster declaration has been put in place in Bear County. Judge Nelson Wolf says that declaration means no outdoor burning will be allowed. On April 19th, county commissioners plan to extend a burn ban. The wildfire at Joint Base San Antonio Camp Bullis shows just how dangerous conditions are in our area. Flames sparked up over the weekend. Tonight, it is 88% contained. More than 3,000 acres have burned. The cause has not yet been released. Meteorologist Adam Kasky tracking this all for us. Adam, we saw some rain in parts of the area tonight. Didn't seem to help with the drought and now we have water restrictions to add to all this. Yeah, we increased our watering restrictions. Saws customers now stage two watering restrictions. We'll get to those in just a moment, but here's a look at where we actually had the rainfall today. Everywhere you see blue or a little splash of green on the screen indicates at least some moisture. You look at the west side of town, Alamo Ranch, SeaWorld area near Taft High School up to about a tenth of an inch, a little bit better in terms of accumulation as you get closer to UTSA and the rim. You see some neighborhoods here, Spring Hollow Street, Spring Manor, about six tenths of an inch. So there were some pockets in some parts of town that actually had some decent accumulations. This is very isolated and generally west and north side of town. Parts of Stone Oak between a half inch and an inch. Typically where you see the green on the screen indicates between a half inch and an inch of rainfall. Not enough to pull us out of drought. Unfortunately, we are in stage two watering restrictions. Now some folks had some hail. This was basically 1604 and bitters about quarter size hail, maybe even slightly bigger from those storms. Of course, you water according to the last number of your address. That'll dictate the day and any time on your watering day between 7 a.m. and 11 a.m. and 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. Of course, handheld watering. Any time, any day, but stage two now in effect. Adam, thank you. In other news, a father killed the gunman on the run. That shooting victim is Juan Alfredo Mendoza. His family is going to lay him to rest tomorrow on the very day that he would have turned 29 years old. This is a murder case that we've been following since March. Tonight, Mendoza's mother tells the night team's Patty Santos that she wants justice. I wish it would be a dream. But it's not. There's no words to describe the pain Magdalena Martinez feels as she prepares to bury her youngest son. I had just talked to him about five minutes before this happened. Juan Alfredo Mendoza was at the stoplight on General McMullen in El Paso on March 25th when he was shot in the head. The police report says his pregnant girlfriend sitting next to him saw a black four-door sedan drive off. A surveillance camera nearby helped police produce this photo. It happened around 7 p.m. I would like to say to the person that did it that you're a coward. You should step up and face us because we want justice for my son. His mother says he was on his way to a family dinner, bedridden. She relied a lot on his help. He was my only son, my only boy. He was my right hand. He was my everything. At any time, I would call him and my son would be here with me. He leaves behind two kids under five and a girlfriend who is five months pregnant. Tonight, the family is pleading for witnesses to help bring them justice. Patty Santos, KSET 12 News. Now for a look at headlines in your night beat news flash. The third and final suspect in a murder out of Seguin finally in handcuffs tonight. This is the photo that Seguin police released of 20 year old Draven Reyes last week. He had hair. Here's the mugshot taken after his arrest this morning. He did not. Reyes accused of shooting two people at a park in Seguin just over a week ago. An 18 year old woman died in that shooting. Two suspects already in custody. Reyes now being held in the Guadalupe County Jail on a $2 million bond. A New York City police, New York City police actually releasing a photo of a person of interest in today's subway shootings. Officers stopped short of calling Frank James a suspect. They do want to talk to him, though. Chaos broke out on the subway during the morning rush hour. Investigators say someone wearing a gas mask set off a gas canister and opened fire. At least 10 people were shot. Police found a U-Haul they believe is linked to the shooting, but they have not said exactly what's inside. A night beat update on DWI arrests during Fiesta. San Antonio police releasing statistics showing a downward trend. 
In 2018, 227 DWI arrests were made during the Fiesta time frame. That dropped to 204 in 2019. Fiesta canceled in 2020. Last year, in a scaled down Fiesta, 169 DWI arrests were made. This year, that number dropped again to 129. But organizations like Mothers Against Drunk Driving say that's still too many. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. Still ahead on the night beat, one local mayor wrapped up in legal trouble. Why that's not stopping him, though, from finishing out his term. That's coming up. And a family broken up by the war in Ukraine. Two children able to escape the devastation and meet their family in San Antonio. The next step in their plan. It's next on the night beat. The eastern part of Ukraine continues to see a buildup of Russian troops. As many as 22,000 people reported to have died in the city of Mariupol. Now there's a concern for a potential chemical attack on that city. The U.S. has not confirmed those reports, but keeping a close eye on the area. Meanwhile, Russia's president declared peace talks are at a dead end. These children, though, managed to escape the bombings in Ukraine, but only two were able to make it to San Antonio where their uncle lives. That uncle, Dmitro Kowalski, met up with his family at the San Antonio airport today. He says the children have spent time in bomb shelters. They had to walk to the border with Poland, and they still have family wanting and waiting to leave Ukraine. Dmitro says only a niece and nephew were able to make it to San Antonio today. First of all, the most important thing is to fix trauma they have now. What we need to, we need to wipe out those, those bad memories and substitute it with good memories. The children's dad staying in Ukraine to fight. The other family members still trying to get paperwork in order to continue their journey to San Antonio. Legal troubles are not going to stop the mayor of Civilo from serving out the remainder of his term. Stan Stosh Boyle and the attorney general's office are agreeing on a plea deal. So this relates to his ability to run for mayor. Some argued that he failed to list a previous felony drug conviction before getting on the ballot in 2017 and 2019. And that led to the current perjury and tampering charges against him. Boyle has said that he didn't list that drug case because he believed that he had been released from the resulting disabilities of his conviction. I don't feel guilt or remorse over it. Um, you know, I did what my heart told me to do and what I was told at the time. So as part of today's plea deal, Boyle's going to be allowed to avoid a conviction if he completes community supervision. He can also finish his term in mid-November before he has to step down. Prosecutors also said that a misdemeanor charge for that 2017 case will also be dismissed. On our latest episode of Breakdown, we're talking mental health, specifically the mental health of teens. One high school student told us that she felt that she needed to hide her anxiety and her depression from the people around her. I was a cheerleader. I was always smiling. I was the one with all of the pep and the spirit. And I just, I began to lose myself, but I knew that I still had to make sure that no one else knew that. That's Ainsley, and you can hear the rest of her story on Breakdown with Steph and Steve tomorrow night. We're also going to hear from experts about signs that parents should be aware of if they think their child is struggling with mental health. So all of this starts at 7 o'clock on KSAT.com and on our streaming app, KSAT+. Plus. We hope you join us. All right, let's check out the weather situation. Live cam tonight, sky 12 over the quarry markets. Some areas got some rain. Yes. Some got hail. Yep. Some got none. Yeah, all or nothing kind of, right? Yeah. And most most people watching actually didn't get anything. It was confined to the north side of town, some parts of the west side. Stone Oak had some hail up to about quarter size in diameter, you know, one inch diameter about the size of quarters. And let's take a look at the radar actually. Nothing to worry about the rest of the night. I mean, I wish we could squeeze out a few more showers, but that's not going to be the case. Maybe a little bit of drizzle here and there later tonight as the low clouds take over. But really, we dodged most of the severe weather today. It was north of us up I-35. We're talking north of Georgetown, Killeen, Waco area. That's where they had numerous reports of very large hail. I mean, I'm think back to 2016 around here.
okay? That size of large hail and even tornado reports. Now that complex has bowed out with uh, straight line wind reports in East Texas moving into Louisiana. That's where the moisture is right now, and our rain chances are pretty slim going forward here into the weekend. Saturday, Sunday, then even Monday, 20% chance. That's the best we can do. Maybe a few random pop up afternoon showers, little storms here and there, but nothing to change your plans about right now. A dry line paid us a visit today, almost made it into Barrett County. Now it's retreating westward. Dew points around 70. It's sticky outside. It feels like springtime, at least locally. You get to Uvalde, dew point of 47, junction 39. You can see that West Texas dry line, the desert air on the west side of it, where we are on the east side of it. We've got that muggy gulf air in place. This will continue to move westward for tonight, but tomorrow it comes back along with the cold front and dew points plummet. We're talking dew points down probably in the teens for parts of the day tomorrow, especially the second part of the day. So with that very dry air in place tomorrow and some winds gusting between 20 and 30 miles per hour, increased fire danger again. Here's our future cast for winds. You look across our area, Bulverde, 8 a.m., some gusts to 30 miles per hour, gusts between 20 and 30 pretty much all day long tomorrow. And of course, that with the dry air puts us in another red flag warning, meaning fires can start quickly. And if they do, they will spread rapidly. Let's talk temperatures. 94 today. That's important because we tied a record record set back in 1948. Del Rio broke a record, making it to 103, breaking the old record by three degrees. Still 90 in Catula, 87 right now. Uvalde 77 San Antonio, New Braunfels and temperatures will fall off about another five to 10 degrees overnight tonight. So tomorrow morning right near 70 degrees is what we're expecting for the most part by tomorrow afternoon. We make it uh, into the 90s again. So 97 Floresville and Nixon, 95 in Castroville and Hondo, 90 to start the day, or I should say by the afternoon in Bernie. That would be a very warm low temperature. That's for the afternoon Bernie and Bulverde at 90 degrees. Other than some low morning clouds early with a little bit of drizzle, don't get excited. It may look like it could rain before and around sunrise, but maybe a sprinkle. That'd be it. So not a big deal. Otherwise, we'll have a lot of sunshine dropping humidity throughout the day, increasing winds. That's why we have that elevated fire danger. Again, the humidity, it'll be returning on Thursday and by Friday, you'll really feel it. High temperatures in the 80s Thursday and Friday by the weekend, muggy, low 90s, and just that slight chance of a few afternoon storms. I mean, I wouldn't be changing any Easter plans around it. One of those situations and yeah, one or two rogue showers popping up. OK, good to know. All right, the playoff play in. Playoff play in began. Yeah, at this point, do the Spurs know who they're going to play next? If they win, we'll kind of give you a hint because the game that's going on right now will determine who they play next if they win in New Orleans tomorrow night. And we are live from New Orleans here in just a moment. Our Larry Ramirez taking a break from, <laughs> I guess, Bourbon Street to give us a live report tonight as you see the Spurs arriving and trouble in Longhorn land coming up. He won't be talking to you guys for a while. <laughs> Is there trouble in Longhorn land? What has Coach Sarkeesian banning a player from talking to the media, Big Board Sports? But first. San Antonio Spurs in New Orleans landing shortly after 3 o'clock this afternoon to prepare for their playing game against the Pelicans tomorrow. Spurs must win in order to advance to the second playing game. Otherwise, their season is over. For jetting to the Mardi Gras City, the Spurs held a final practice, and that's where our Larry Ramirez and crew met up with the team after their arrival. So let's take you live right now to New Orleans, and that's where we find our Larry Ramirez. Hi, Larry. Hello, Greg, and good evening, everybody. So the Spurs are healthy and ready to face the Pelicans tomorrow night right here at the Smoothie King Center where the Spurs went 2-0 during the regular season. But the Spurs will tell you they know that means nothing come tomorrow when that play-in game tips off. So check it out. The Spurs arrived here in New Orleans to their team hotel right around 3.30 this afternoon. And here's Joshua Primo, Devin Vassell, Lonnie Walker IV, Kata Bates-Diop, and DJ getting off the team bus. The guys are currently five-and-a-half-point underdogs despite going 3-1 against New Orleans this season. The Spurs Pelicans playing game will be nationally televised, a first for the Spurs this season. And that's special for them because it will give the silver and black a chance to make a statement on TVs from coast to coast.
I think that's big for us. I think I talked about it earlier this year. Like we want to be seen, we want to be recognized. Like we haven't had it, we haven't had a game like that on ESPN and being able to be seen. So this is big for us and big for everybody. You know, we earned a little respect. You know, not a lot. You know, there's a lot of great teams in this league, but you know, what I'm saying I think teams should know. You know, what I'm saying that we're 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 doing something and we're working on something positive here. Here is that matchup. Tip is set for tomorrow night at 8.30 on ESPN. It is win or go home for the Spurs. Greg, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Larry. Let's take a look at the playing games tonight. The Nets have secured their playoff position for now. And as far as the Clippers and the Timberwolves, right now the Timberwolves are leading. So that would mean if the Spurs win, they would face the Clippers if the Clippers do not come back. Trouble in Longhorn land. Wait until you hear what one starter had to say about some of his teammates. Next. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The Washington Commanders have kept two sets of books to hide revenue. That's according to the U.S. House Oversight and Reform Committee in a letter sent to the Federal Trade Commission. According to ESPN, the 20-page letter contains, contends, in other words, is a multi-year process of altering records to conceal revenue that led to more profits for the NFL team. The financial improprieties were discovered during an investigation by the committee into the team's workplace culture. It was during that investigation longtime employee Jason Freeman alleged that the team might have retained as much as $5 million in deposits for many as 2,000 customers. Tension is reaching a boiling point in Austin, turning the burnt orange red after senior defensive lineman Moro Ojomo spoke candidly to the media last Thursday about the toxic culture on the 40 acres. Ojomo is upset at a few of the players are more concerned about partying and getting name, image, and likeness money than playing football. He was asked, why don't the younger guys listen to more experienced teammates? I mean, it's it's hard. They're they're 18 to 22 year olds that want to chase women, want to chase money, want to chase alcohol, and they don't see they don't see the future. Mm -hmm. They're very distracted by like what is in front of them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's it's such a hard thing, especially guys that haven't been in a winning culture. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very easy for a lot of these powerhouses to keep going because it's established. So the new guys just come in and they're like, oh, this is how we have to do it. Oh, this is what we do, right? It's so much more difficult. You know, they always talk about coming here and changing stuff. Like coming here and changing stuff, it's like, it's ingrained. You know what I mean? Like you're uprooting, what, 10 years of that's just been like, let go and go by. Like they're more worried about being on 6th Street than like balling and making $50 million. Mm -hmm. It's crazy as hell. Those comments drew the ire of Horns head coach Steve Sarkeesian, who is asked what he had to say about that today. He should not have done that in public. Um, a player-led team, a really good player-led team, those issues, and if you have issues with anything, get taken care of in the locker room, get taken care of in the meeting room. Um, if you're really a family, you don't go out and talk about family business. Um, you take care of things internally. So that's the first part. I think his intentions were right, but the, the delivery and the form that it was used was poor. Yeah, I'm talking to the media. Packed house with the Wolf tonight, opening night to watch the San Antonio Missions take on the Frisco Rough Riders. Top of the first with the runner on second. Frisco comes out firing. Blaine Krim rips it down the line just out of the reach of the diving third baseman. That allows Frisco to go up 1-0. Bottom of the first, Missions respond. Bases loaded for Mitch Walding. He sends the pitch to the corner in right. That will bring home two Missions to make it a 2-1 ball game. The Missions can't hold on, and they fall 6-4 on opening night. Great to see the crowd out there, though. They'll always be tomorrow. Yeah, thanks, Greg. <laughs> We're back in two minutes. Before we go, it is an auction that is out of this world. Okay. Tomorrow, several items of space history will go up for sale in New York. That includes the first sample of lunar dust collected by astronaut Neil Armstrong. That was back in 1969. The estimated sale price between 800000 to $1.2 million. Okay. That is cool. For lunar dust. <laughs> I know, I know. But listen, it's better than some of the other things, like outrageous prices that people pay for, I don't know, like a weird diamond or a, I don't know. Yeah. I agree. At least this is very unique. Nobody else is going to have lunar dust. Come on. It's true. Right? I feel yes, like you would. If I go to your house and you say you have lunar dust, I'm going to go, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. You got I got to go. You got That's that off your mantle. That's Port A sand. <laughs> <laughs> have a great night. See you tomorrow.